So I know that some of you are very comfortable reading EKGs, while others of you are not as confident doing so. And if you get through all of medical school without knowing how to read an EKG, that's a crime. That's really a crime on our part that we didn't teach that to you. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to go through the basic process of reading an EKG, just the this, this simple process. And what I want you to do is go grab as many of these as you can and read as many EKGs as you can. And you can watch this video as many times as you need to. So let's, let's do that. And so the first things that we're going to look at are those numbers down there, the things that you probably really never pay too much attention to. So let me expand those for a sec. So the two numbers we're going to look at right now first is this one that got cut off, 25 millimeters per second, and this other one here, 10, millivolt, 10 millimeters per millivolt. So let's look at that one first. What this, so if you look at these boxes here, first of all, this is one, what we call one big box, and they're split up into five smaller boxes. You might not be able to see it on your monitor, depending on the resolution of the video, but that's what it looks like and what you'll see when you look at a real EKG. Each one of these small boxes here is a millimeter. So one big box is five millimeters. So we know now that if 10 millimeters is a millivolt, that means two big boxes is a millivolt. And that's what this thing here represents. This is two big boxes in size. And that means this is the, the amplitude of one millivolt. Now I'll be honest with you, you're probably never going to have to look at this, but there are a few times when you might. Maybe the QRS, this little spike here, is super huge and it goes way off the screen and you can't really assess it. So maybe you adjust this number here on the EKG machine to make it 5 millimeters equals a millivolt, in which case you'd see this box is actually much smaller and then you could fit more on there. Or alternatively, maybe you have a very small amp small amplitude on your EKG tracing so you can make this bigger. 20 millimeters is a millivolt so you can see things a lot better. Now let's go back to this number here, the 25 millimeters per second. So we know that 25 millimeters would mean five of these big boxes, right? Because we know each one is five, so one, two, three, four, five. So this is one second. Now this has a couple implications. First of all, uh, you might have an EKG that is so the, the patient is so tachycardic and everything is so cramped that you want to spread things out. And so you might want to make 50 millimeters a second. And so you could adjust this to kind of spread things out as well. So that would be doing what we call a double speed EKG. The other thing that that means is a couple things that each one of these boxes here, that's equal to about 200 milliseconds. And each one of the small boxes is 40 milliseconds. So when we need to measure times and things like that, we're going to use these numbers. Again, 200 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds. And we know five boxes is one second. And then if you were to come back to the big EKG here, the whole thing, you would see that if we were to break up this EKG into several of these five block one second segments that we would have 10 of them so an entire EKG is 10 seconds uh, total. So now we're ready to look at the first thing we want to measure on an EKG and that's the rate. And rate is measured in beats per minute and a minute is of course 60 seconds and we know that this EKG is here 10 seconds uh, in length so to get a minute, we would have to have six of these. So one way to calculate the rate is to just count how many beats are in this EKG and multiply it by six. So, you know, we, let's, let's take it here. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So the rate here would be 15 times six or 90. So that's one way to measure the rate. There's another way, and that involves counting the number of big boxes between two consecutive beats. So you try and find one that's uh, fairly close to being on one of these lines, and this one's pretty close, and we'll see how many boxes are in there. One, two, three, between three and four. And the rate you can calculate by uh, counting each box uh, like this. So this would be 300. 150, 100, 75, 60, uh, I believe then it's 50. And so what this means here is that if the next beat were to fall right over here, that would be 300 beats per minute. 
If it falls over here, that would be 150 beats per minute. If it fell over here, that would be 100 beats per minute. This would be 75 beats per minute. So what do we have here? We have something that falls between 100 and 75, and it's much closer to the 100 side of it. So I would probably guess around 90. So 90 beats per minute, which is what we calculated the other way. So that's two ways to measure the rate. Honestly, the way that I look at the rate is I just look at what the machine calculates because it's going to do a much better job than I do. However, there are some times when the machine is wrong, so it's good to know how to do it this way, too. So that's how you calculate rate. The next thing that we want to look at after rate is rhythm. And we should re uh, review the, Q the EKG morphology uh, real quickly. And so this is what you would see. And so this first wave, there's the P wave. This first downward thing is a Q. This first up is an R. The second one is an S that goes down. And then this is a T. So if we look at it again, here we got P, Q, R, S, and T. And I'm sure you remember that the P stands, it represents the atrial depolarization. And the QRS is the ventricular depolarization. And finally, the T is the ventricular repolarization. So you remember that the the whole EKG is representing the change in charge across a membrane, so the atrium gets depolarized and it gets repolarized. And that repolarization of the atria is actually buried in the QRS, so you don't see it. And then that gets spread to the ventricles, and then you get the QRS for its depolarization, and when it finally goes back to normal, that's the repolarization in the T. So that's our PQRST. This is what we would call normal sinus rhythm. Because, as, as you'll remember, the the impulse all starts in the SA node, and then it all the charges kind of come down to the AV node. There's a little bit of a delay there, then the AV node fires, and all the electricity kind of goes down what I call the superhighways of the uh, electrical system, because it goes down so fast, and from there it spreads across the ventricles. Okay, so that's normal sinus rhythm. It starts at the SA node, then moves to the AV node, comes down these these bundles here and finally goes across the ventricles. So now let's look at what that looks like on a real EKG. So here we go. So let's look at this uh, in V3 here. So we got our P. There's no Q, but you got the R, then the S, and then the T, right? And then you got your P again, the R, then the S, and then the T. So if you have this morphology, P, Q, R, S, T, then we call that normal sinus rhythm. So let's look at one more here. This looks complicated, but don't worry. We're going to just simplify it right now. We're just looking for that PQRST morphology here. So let's look at one of them. Let's pick uh, this, this lead here, AVL. So we see that it's kind of bumpy here, but I don't really see any P's there. There's no P wave here. No P. But there's definitely this R and then this S, right? And so we still, even though there's no Q there, we'll still call that the QRS complex. There's not always a Q, but that's the QRS complex. And then there's a T, right? And then what happens next? Again, there's no P wave there. There's no P. Then we get our QRS, and we got our T. And if we keep going on, look, no, no P, but then there's your QRS again and your T. So what's happening here? This is not normal sinus rhythm because it's not following our P, Q, R, S, T. This is actually atrial fibrillation, which we can talk about later. But what you'll notice here is that with atrial fibrillation, the uh, the impulse is not started at the SA node. It's just starting kind of all over the place, right? And whichever one decides to kind of hit the AV node, then that gets conducted down these uh, bundles here, and that's what causes the QRS to form. And so it, it's not regular because it's just whichever randomly one of these impulses somehow makes it down to the AV nodes, which is going to fire it. So you're going to see this kind of waviness here because this atrium is not depolarizing properly, right? It just does it in that uh, random fashion, and then every now and then you're going to get a QRS. So it's irregular. I mean, it's not, there's not a steady rhythm here, and it's not... So we call this irregularly irregular, and that's atrial fibrillation. But don't worry about that. The main thing that you're going to notice here is that this is not normal sinus. There is no PQRS. T here. It's just QRST, then randomly at some other time another QRST. So, so far what we've covered are these numbers here at the bottom which correspond to how tall and how long things are going to be. And in calculating the rate we looked at two ways. One is counting the number of beats on the EKG and multiplying it by six. Or the other way 
is to count how many big boxes are in between two beats and just memorize this pattern, 300, 150, 175, 60, 50. And then you can estimate that way. Then we moved on to rhythm. And we know that a normal sinus rhythm is P, Q, R, S, T, followed by P, Q, R, S, T, uh, because we know that it's going to follow this electrical conduction. So this is rate and rhythm. Next video, we'll go on to axis.